Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. I want to thank uh, ICNYU, mashallah, for hosting us uh, on this this weekend uh, and, and series of workshops and, and seminars that we are doing throughout the New York area uh, and the East Coast. Uh, special thanks to Imam Khalid, uh, your uh, chaplain in spiritual leadership uh, over here and, and largely in the, you know, in, in, in sort of the Manhattan and, and, and greater New York area as well. It seems that, uh, mashallah, uh, you all are doing very important work and, and I pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept it from you, inshallah. Um, just to kind of tie into what Dr. Rani is talking about, she uh, presented a lot of the history of the Islamic tradition as a demonstration of the gold mine of information and literature and the richness of the Islamic intellectual heritage. And that has been largely ignored within modernity. And I think she did a you know more than sufficient job to illustrate that point. What I wanted what we are wanting to do at Khalil Center is to be able to now in in modernity or postmodernity, uh, be able to take all of this huge store of this tradition, this intellectual tradition and heritage, and be able to develop models and mechanisms and modalities of being able to assess and treat uh, what we would call psychological and spiritual illnesses. And so that is. Uh, and, and what I'm going to do right now is I'm going to give you uh, an ontological kind of human, human ontological way of thinking uh, or approach. Um, essentially what that means is our understanding or theology of human beings. It's a model among models, okay? So, but we, this, I, f we, I found this in particular to be very useful for being able to integrate a lot of behavioral science research, um, provide a structure that is principled within our own intellectual heritage to be able to be conducive to the treatment uh, of, um, of mental illness and psychological and spiritual. So I'll give you sort of an outline as, uh, and, and, and I'm gonna hopefully go over this briefly. In our trainings, we do this a year long. It's a very sort of brief orientation to the model to give you just a framework of being able to, how to think about mental health and how to think about the human psyche and how to think about its sickness as well as its treatment. The, se the other part that, you know, the more intro level that I would do before this is more of an epistemological kind of conversation and, and what that literally means is the sources of knowledge. So one of the things that Dr. Rania is also alluding to uh, largely is that through the European intellectual tradition and heritage, which is very different than the Islamic intellectual heritage, I'm not saying that there's no exchanges, certainly there's exchanges. Um, there's a series, and I'm not gonna get into the history because it would make for a separate lecture. There's a series of processes that occurs uh, all the way through uh, the Dark Ages, through um, uh, the Enlightenment and Renaissance, etc., into modernity, postmodernism, uh, post that you get this uh, process of an inability to reconcile the sacred with the with the quote unquote uh, uh, you know uh, secular sciences. Okay, scholastic theology took an attempt at it; they couldn't square the circle. So eventually what they did was they sort of discarded, uh, uh, you know, uh, religion from anything that had to do with science. And hence, in postmodernity, the way that healthcare is delivered, the way the medical model is constructed, is built upon this. That doesn't mean that it's all bad. Certainly any knowledge that we uh, accept uh, that is valid and true source of knowledge, we will accept that. As a, and, and that would get me into what would be our, our sources of knowledge? How do we reconcile? Because we didn't actually ever see this dilemma in our tradition of the secular versus the sacred. And, and I would you know, love on a separate occasion to talk about what that epistemological 
uh, approach would be um, that is rooted within our own aqidah, our creed, that would allow us to be able to understand where to appropriate, fit in the science, behavioral science, within the larger the body of knowledge or ilm, sources of knowledge, because it is a source of ilm. It's a source of knowledge. And there are ulum, different kinds of knowledge. And so I would, you know, give you that framework, but, you know, I'll save that for another time. And maybe I'm, uh, you know, just sort of teasing you a little bit so that you invite me again. I don't know. Maybe that's mm -hmm. sort of uh, my, uh, as Freud might think, my unconscious desire, need, or conflict internally that I want to be <laughs> invited again. Maybe that's why I'm doing this. But, um,. But that's a separate conversation. What I want to focus on, I want you to re so I want you to sort of take a leap of faith with me without the illustration, right? Uh, take a leap of faith with me to say that it is a branch of knowledge, and that we that the Islamic heritage has an ability to reconcile between worldly and sacred knowledge and the different sources of knowledge. And now that's going to segue into human ontology. And the reason why I mention that is very important for us to understand that we do not draw a distinction between secular, worldly knowledge uh, uh, and, and the sacred. There's no such division in the Islamic tradition. This does not exist. And so when we talk about mental health, we don't want to impose these constructs or, or restrictions upon the discourse or the way that we talk about mental health. So I'm going to take actually a very... Uh, a, a sort of a, a, a sort of an integrated uh, Islamic uh, approach to presenting. Um, sorry, I have to put my password in here. That's so nobody can steal these slides, right? Mm -hmm. um, so I'm going to give you a sort of an integrated approach to 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 illustrate to you how we do that. And this is an illustration of the kinds of things we're doing at Khalil Center. It's, 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 it's complex, it's labor intensive through such research and our affiliation with the Stan Stanford Lab and Dr. Rania's academic research. And then we're taking a lot of that academic into the applied setting as well. And so I'm gonna illustrate to you sort of a model as to how we would work with mental health in an applied setting. So when we talk about, um, when we talk about health, what comes to mind? I mean, the opposite of that is sickness. What is sickness? Can anybody give me uh, what they might think is uh, uh, a mental sickness or psychological illness or psychiatric illness? What do we think of when we think of psychological illness? Schizophrenia? So, uh, uh, so somebody doesn't have the faculty of reasoning Depression, so emotions, uh, problems with the emotions or sadness, so faculty of reasoning, presence of mind, uh, emotions, what else? Anxiety, Anxiety fears, narcissistic personality. So I'm going to, uh, you know, I didn't plant him because actually I like, to f I like to always illustrate narcissistic personality disorder. This is a good one. So... Uh, narcissistic personality disorder is in what? Is in the DSM, right? It's an axis two disorder. Well, the axis system is gone now. It's in the DSM five. Um, so now, uh, uh, narcissistic personality disorder is 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 how do we define a mental illness though? In in according to how we define it now, it's based upon um, social, occupational, or familiar distress ultimately. That, that your distress somehow causes some problems in your social life, in your family life, and your work life. You're missing work, you're you know, uh, fighting with uh, all sorts of family and society, you're sort of socially outcasted or whatever. So narcissism is not good for that purpose. But it has to reach to the degree of what? Affecting your life, your worldly life. Okay, let's take, uh, how many of you know a narcissist, <laughs> a nar not narcissist personality disorder, but a narcissist 
that actually it serves them well, or her. They have a lot of confidence. They have a lot of uh, you know motivation and desire to kind of be seen and be around special company and that sort of thing and to be regarded uh, with among the special people. And we're not talking about sick people. It's, it's not that kind of special people, right? Although actually he's probably a sick person. Uh, the so the thing is what. But that's actually serving up. Would a DSM classify that as a sickness? No. It would not be seen as a sickness because actually it's serving him or her. It's not a dysfunction. But, as, but what about in the Akhirah? Spiritually, now when we integrate, we say we're not drawing a distinction between the psychological, mental health, worldly, and the Akhirah. Is he going to enter? Is, will that, if the person doesn't make tawbah from it, will there? No, there's nobody is going to enter Jannah even with the, uh, with an uh, with a mustard seed of, takabur, arrogance, kibur. Right. So now that does what? I'm intentionally illustrating this to poke a hole in our conception of what is health and sickness. And when we're talking about reforming human behavior, cognition, emotions. Right? What we have to integrate, that which is spiritual, because tikaburiza is behaviors, thinking, emotions, all these sorts of things. So I'm illustrating to you that sickness is actually on a continuum, right? But but that there is different kinds of sickness. There's sort of like the clinical range. So we're not saying clinical doesn't exist, right? So if you're if you're having depression to such an extent that you can't get out of bed, that your appetite is shot, you're having like suicidal thoughts and that's like, okay, maybe it's in the clinical range. But then we have in the normal range, which we'd conceive of as being a no normal range, you're not exempt from intervention here. Because what is the pathway or the goal of the believer? Let me go back to this. Where, where are we going? We're going to the Akhirah. The reality is that anything on our pathway towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that interrupts that ability or takes us off course of that pathway is what? Worthy of intervention and is a sickness that needs to be treated. Right? So, it's not the biopsychosocial model, but the spiritual model as well. And even if you don't fit the clinical range, and you're within this category, you may still very well be within the intervention ring. Now, this is important for our history because it also addresses a stigma. We're not all above intervention, right? That means that we are all spiritually sick, illa mashallah, to some extent, and that we need intervention, islah, right? To be able to remedy. Why? Because the stakes are high. We're going to meet Allah one day inshallah that's certain any science will tell you that that we're all going to die and that we're going to meet Allah eventually and so that is worthy of intervention then we have this range which is the station of awliya okay so this is somebody who is uh, sort of in the let's take anxiety uh, clinical anxiety okay uh, and then we have somebody in the uh, uh, somebody who's sort of anxious Right, always worried about when after you know my exams tomorrow. What am I gonna you know so so much uh, anxiety that when you stand for salah, you're thinking about your exams. You're not thinking about salah, right? So you have no khushu. Okay, so those are that that those might be indicative of some intervention that's necessary. And then we have the station of the awliya, and this is the relationship between between spirituality. And resiliency, having spiritual resilience against psychological dysfunction. Uh, and I'll recite uh, uh, an ayah to uh, illustrate the point. Behold the awliya Allah, the, the friends of Allah. There is no fear anxiety or grief or depression upon them, well, not depression, grief upon them. Now, uh, uh, and, and later, and, and down the surah, الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا وَكَانُوا يَتَّقُونَ What do they have? They have two qualities. 
iman, and not any kind of iman, but taqwa, a higher state of iman. That's their quality. What does this taqwa do? Uh, there is bushra fil hayat al dunya wal akhira. There is glad tidings upon them in this dunya and the akhira. One of the tafsir I found for this is that the bushra goes back to the la khawf alayhim wa hum yahzanun. When typically this means to the akhira. Typically when you're in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you know if you've done well, you don't need to worry about that. But in this context, it's a one, a one of the taf- tafsir I found is that it goes back to the dunya as well. So, and then the explanation is that it's not that they don't feel sadness or anxiety at all, but they have such resiliency with their spirituality that they feel it much differently than you and I do. What's amazing is that modern psychology will support this notion. A, because there's just so much literature on spiritual resilience, number one. Number two, there's a distinction between clinical depression and grief. Grief is adaptive. It's growth promoting. Does it hurt? Absolutely it hurts. Anybody who's lost a loved one or had some serious tragedy happen to them, certainly you feel the grief, don't you? And what did they say about grief? You have to feel it. You have to accept it. You have to work with the emotion. But... In clinical, clinical is sick, sickness. It's not useful sadness. It weighs you down. It, it fe- it's, the, it's almost like the absence of feeling, actually. You know? It, it, you, in grief, you're really feeling it. In, not, in depression, you're not feel. You're sort of a numbing. You're sort of numbed out now. Vegetative, even. If it gets that severe, you sort of lay in bed and you don't want to do anything. You're not interested in anything. It's the absence of feeling. So what is this to illustrate? The point is that we have, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, to to demonstrate that sickness does not only include that which we can, you know, that which is the psychological that we would typically think of, but it also integrates the spiritual and it's very holistic. Additionally. Our conception, now onto the sort of ontology part, our con- uh, uh, well, that was sort of our schema for health. So what did we establish by that? That health is that which, sickness is what? Anything that takes us away from our actual purpose in life, and that's ubudiyah lillah, to worship Allah and to get to Allah, the ma'rif of Allah, the cognizance or awareness of Allah. Anything that takes us away from that. That's sort of worthy of treatment. So that's sickness. Okay? And health is the absence of sickness, the pursuit, being on the pursuit towards that. You're always, uh, your uh, health is indicated by your constant pursuit. Right? Uh, towards what? Until until death comes to you. Now you're on the pursuit. And when we get when we do more and more of this, we develop spiritual resilience. Okay? And I'm not going to get into the how, because obviously that's sort of a separate conversation for a separate day. Now, maybe another lecture series you'll invite me for. Right? <laughs> um, now we'll talk about the, the fitrah. And I'm going to preface this. I'm taking sort of a maturidi aqidah kind of uh, 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 perspective on the fitrah. Just to kind of preface, because... Sometimes we don't like it when people don't label their framework, and other people like it's not. That's not the Islamic modality. It's a an Islamic modality of looking at it. The fitra. كل مولود يولد على الفطرة فأباه يهودانه أو ينصرانه أو يمجسانه. That every person is born upon the fitra, and the fitra is. It, it means that that they are propelled towards that which is good. Okay, so number one, I mean, even evolutionary psychologists will say that each individual is born with an inherent inclination to believe in a God, in a creator. The reason why they'll say is different than why we say it's, than why we would say that. But they at least acknowledge that everybody has inherent in them a belief in a creator or some being divine beyond us, something existing beyond us. And uh, so um, we believe in a creator and the Maturidis would also say universal truths as well. Universal moralities and goods we would say as well. 
that you can distinguish between murder and stealing in the, on that and say that people are inclined towards good. Okay? The reason why I'm covering this is because the way that you conceive of the human being is going to determine how you treat the human being. You have to understand how the human being works in order to work with that human being. So Freud, for example, believes that the human being is inherently bad. You know, sort of driven by the uh, sexual uh, impulses and death instinct and that sort of thing. That's sort of his philosophy of, or ontology or theology, rather, of, human con of, of the human being. And then we have the other extreme, which is a postmodernist idea, Carl Rogers and sort of postmodernist humanists. They'll say that the human being's inherently good. So we agree with that to a notion, to, a, to an extent, but they say they don't need, whatever you believe to be good is good. So you don't, we just need to nurture them. We need to provide them an accepting, non judgmental space. That's it. That's what will melt the dysfunction. But for us, that's not the case. We believe in a fitrah, in an inherent goodness of the human being. Everybody is born upon good, but there are certain other components of that human being as well. And this is really the, the basis of our model here. The basis of our model. And that is that the human being is an interconnected human being. And this is our schema of the, human, of the Muslim psyche. Or the Muslim psyche, human psyche. And, the, and, and uh, Imam al this is consistent with Imam al-Ghazali's work. Okay? So, let's take a look at this. We have a fitrah, and we're disposed to good, propelled towards good. Let me backtrack on one thing. I'm just going to put this up just so you can appreciate it for those that want to see that we, in our tradition we have this idea of propelling you know, inherent drives. What are the drives that, 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 that are behind uh, behavior? And these are uh, sort of the human potentials or instincts where Freud talks about the sexual in instincts and the libido and all of that, that's sort of the driving force behind human nature. Um, you know, Rogers is talking about self-actualization and becoming completely in non-judgmental space and accepting your full potential. We have, you know, we have some of this stuff, but I'm not going to you know, talk about it. This is uh, also for another day, perhaps a lecture series. Uh, now, we have the the sort of conception of the human being, okay, the Muslim psyche, or rather the human psyche. And at the, at, at the heart of it, pun intended, <laughs> right, is the heart, right? <laughs> that verily, their hearts have rusted on account of what they, yaksibun, what they do. So everything that you do, the human being does on this outer layer, has what? an impact on the heart. The heart is the receiver and holder of all of this stuff. What you put in, uh, what you do with your actions will put what? Blackness in the heart, black in the heart, or what you do with it will enlighten uh, the heart. Right? And ala inna fil jasad mudghatan. Ida salahat salah al jasad kulu. Ida fasadat fasad al jasad kulu. Ala wahi al qalb. There is a piece of flesh in the heart, in in the body. That if it is sound, everything else will be healthy and upright. If every if it is corrupt, then everything else will be corrupt as well. And behold, that is the heart. Now we have this sort of outer structure, and that is the uh, the the things that we do. Okay. We have emotions, okay, emotions, then we have the ruh, our spirit, we have the aql, our thinking, and we have the nafs. And uh, I'll, I'm going to kind of do a speed through each of, uh, each of these things. I mean, and the aql is ultimately the store of all of your thoughts, your beliefs, your ideas, your constructs of the world. The fact that you're all sitting here today, you know, uh, listening attentively, uh, not talking to each other, you know, not walking around doing jumping jacks or yoga, right? Yoga's in the other room, right? I mean, maybe somebody's in the wrong place. But the yoga's in the other room. So the fact that you're doing all this comes from some norms that you've learned, some ideas as to my construct of what is 
a lecture. What do you do in a lecture? When somebody is speaking or educating, I sit down, I listen, I write, you know, I might write things down, some people are doing so, uh, you know, uh, uh, all of these sorts of things. This is a construct, we have a construct that we've developed in our minds. There's all sorts of constructs. What we believe of Allah, what we believe in the Akhirah, what we believe about relationships, what we believe about expectations, marital expectations, what is uh, the role of a woman versus the role of a, a man, and husband expectations of the wife, and the wife expectations. We have all these expectations. And some of them do what? Help you? Enlighten the heart? Right? And some of them actually cause suffering. And I'll, I'll give you a concrete illustration of that, inshallah. Then there's your nafs. So there is a fitrah that propels you towards good. But the, you also have a nafs. وَنَفْسٍ وَمَا سَوَّهَا فَأَلْهَمَهَا فُجُورَهَا وَتَقْوَاهَا Allah takes an oath by the nafs and how He fashioned it that it has the capacity for good and it also has the capacity for evil. So we're not like Freud. We don't believe that you're, it's inherently bad. And Imam Al-Ghazali gives a description of this and he talks about the nafs is like a horse. It's a very common analogy. It, if the horse is not trained, it's wild, it's not trained, it's not functional, right? It doesn't serve you in any way. It, if it, and the nafs is the same way. And it's about discipline. The more you do, uh, the more you discipline the nafs, the more it will serve you, right? If you have bad study habits your whole life and then you come to college and things end up getting harder, you might not do as well. If you're inherently intelligent, got you through to high school, it's not going to get you anywhere now because you just don't have control over your impulses. And our society, mashallah, kind of uh, feeds a hedonistic materialism. Right? And there's subdivisions, but in the interest of time, I'm not going to go into them. The nafs al-ammara bisu, nafs al-lawama, nafs al-mutma'inna. Ultimately, it gets us to the nafs al-mutma'inna through the process of islah, working on uh, the nafs and discipline, you get to the nafs al-mutma'inna. And that is when you are automatically propelled to do that which is consistent with your fitrah number one, but also consistent with what the sharia wants of you, what Allah wants of you. So somebody goes to pray salah, they do what? They, you know, if, if you're not accustomed to praying salah regularly, it feels hard. But when you're accustomed to praying it every time, when the time is running short, you get anxious, right? You start to actually get anxious, like you need to do this. It's, it's pre-programmed, it's part of your routine. Then we have the ruh, sp spirituality, right? Uh, that it is with the dhikr of Allah, remembrance of Allah, that, that you feed the ruh. And the ruh needs dhikrullah. It needs... It needs Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It needs the divine. And then we have your emotions. And emotions is one of those things that people have had a difficult time trying to figure out. Uh, emotions, there's a lot of emotion theory. And ultimately it needs expression. And it needs, uh, um, uh, it, it, it needs expression, emotional awareness. You need awareness of your emotions. You need to have expression of your emotions, right? And regulation of your emotions. Like the Prophet Sallallahu what did he do? When his son cried, I mean, he, when his uh, son uh, Ibrahim, uh, radiallahu anhu, he passed away, what did he do? He shed a tear. But he also for prohibited excessive emotional dysregulation, right? So there's a way, emotions have adaptive expressions like grief, Sadness in a healthy way. It also has a maladaptive, unhealthy expressions, which is oftentimes clinical or not useful. Emotions have an underlying need, and if they're not addressed, then they end up creating sickness. And emotion, em emotion theory, and, and talking about emotion is itself like a long conversation as well. So that's sort of the illustration of the psyche. And now let's take a concrete illustration. I'm focusing on this because really this is sort of the, 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 the meat of uh, what I want to present to you. So let's take for example, and, and each sickness can be on any of these 
uh, places. And where you intervene predominantly is going to be where the sickness is. But even if you intervene elsewhere, you will have a residual impact on the whole system. In the same way that your sickness has a residual impact on the whole system. So for example, let's say a person believes that that tragedy and suffering means that they're getting punished by Allah. How are you going to feel? How would you feel? Hopeless, sad, right? Okay. How would you behave? How would it impact your behavior? You can become hyper-religious. That's one, that's one possibility. To such an extent, you might even develop like ritualistic OCD type behaviors, right? That's one possibility. Oftentimes, it's more related to, you know, anxiety and fear rather than sort of um, uh, sadness, right? So it can be sort of anxiety. It can propel you towards anxiety. It can propel you towards sadness. Maybe it'll express differently in different people. It might do the exact opposite. If you're depressed, then what does it do? It'll cause you to be in a vegetative state. It's like, oh, there's no point. I'm going to Jahannam anyways. <laughs> Forget it. I'm not going to indulge in... You know, you sort of become hopeless and you don't, you don't end up trying anymore. How does it affect your spirit? You have this void in your heart. You don't experience true satisfaction or contentment. And there's a lot of data on this idea of contentment and satisfaction... As opposed to, she's my co-presenter actually. <laughs> she, we, we timed that. She was like, she came right on time. So, th this a lot of literature on contentment and satisfaction. And how it's different than happiness. Happiness and contentment are different. And, you know, differentiating emotions is for another day in our emotion module, inshallah. Um, now, we can take another example. I'm going to take three or four minutes over my time, inshallah. Nafs, let's say a person has an impulse control disorder, pornography addiction, okay? What happens? How does it impact the aql? At that moment when you feel the intensity of the inclination, and I work with a lot of these kinds of folks, mind you, they, uh, what do they do? They start to rationalize. It's okay, uh, you know, I'll make toba later, whatever, I, you know, whatever. Okay. How does it affect their emotions? Well, afterwards they feel immense guilt and sadness and even depression. How does it affect their spirituality? Oh, I can't concentrate on Salah. I feel like there's this like disconnect between me and Allah. I don't know what to do. It just it doesn't sit spiritually well. It's sort of not comforting. You understand? So this is an illustration. And I would get into even more articulation of all of these things. In fact, in the Aql, you know, Abu Zayd al-Balkhi has a lot that he talks about regarding cognition. There's uh, uh, Razi, Ghazali. There's like so much, uh, just a wealth of information about our cognitions and our emotions. Like, for example, sadness, it causes you to think in the past. Uh, uh, you know, a fear and anxiety causes you to worry about the future. And our scholars, our mashaykh, have written about this in our tradition. And now we have sort of behavioral science and cognitive research sort of illustrating and discussing this stuff. And so, again, just to kind of reiterate the point of Dr. Rania is that, you know, this is our tradition. And it's not, it doesn't mean that we don't embrace anything that behavioral science has to say, like I incorporated emotion theory. But it's very consistent, has to fit consistently with A, our epistemology, which is, you know, we've forwarded that for a different calendar date, and our, and our human conception of, of human ontology, right? And these are our, and the ultimate role of the therapist is, is to be a murabbi, is to help balance all of these things, which is the principles of change. In Kishaf, it's awareness in first. It's awareness of your sickness. If Allah, um, Allah Ta'ala wants good for a believer, He will give that uh, abd, uh, the slave the capacity to be aware of their own dysfunction and their deficiencies. So you help them gain in kishaf, awareness, 
i'tidal. This is Mohan Bilal's, uh, uh, you know, uh, translation. Psycho, psycho, spiritual equilibrium. And then he accuses me of using fancy words. <laughs> so I've adopted his translation, actually. Um, and then a wahdat al wujud is sort of a linguistic. I mean, I know it's not the best choice of terms sometimes because you go to Ibn Arabi. I'm not necessarily intending Ibn Arabi's usage of it, but more of a literal, actual expression of it. In that, an integrative whole. Your, your, your being becomes whole where all of these things become what? Balanced. And there's a balance between all of these things. Our mashaykh have articulated when the nafs, you know, when you're uh, devoting too much to spirituality, you're not giving the haq of the body, for example. You're devoting too much to thinking, you're not giving haq to the emotion, for example. Or you're giving too much to the emotion, you're not giving enough to the... So there's a sort of idea of imbalance and a restoration to what? A balance holistic way of being which is like the modern slogan today right and so this is this is sort of just the demonstration and illustration and inshallah in our panel discussions we can talk, talk about it more and I'd be happy to kind of talk with anybody who's interested sort of exploring this a little bit further there's several publications regarding regarding this model uh, you can ask me about it I can share the publication with you inshallah if you want to learn more about it um, and at this point, I'll go ahead and, and, and pass the mic to um, uh, Sheikh Rami uh, and, and Mawlana Bilal, and, and I'll do a brief introduction to them, because they probably won't introduce themselves. Um, Mo uh, Mawlana Bilal is, um, I've known him for the past 10 years, he's been a personal mentor and, uh, and teacher of mine and a good friend. Um, he is uh, the president of the, uh, of the board of directors at, at Khalil Center. He's also the head of the department of Hadith at Darul Qasim. He and I have worked very closely on some of these models. A lot of the fruits of this has come through our discussions. Um, and, uh, and, and we do research. So he also has office hours where he actually does research weekly at Khalil Center. Uh, he also does religious consultations, which is something that he'll talk about. Sheikh Rami is, uh, has, uh, is also on our board. He is a, he's a scholar of the Islamic tradition, uh, particularly in exp has expertise in the Maliki tradition, and, um, and he also serves as a religious consultant, uh, and he also, which he never publicizes, has a master's in educational psychology, uh, and, and, and he sort of says, I don't have the place to talk about psychology, though, though he's re really an expert on it. Um, and, and he brings all of this together to also help inform the direction, vision, and mission of the organization, but also uh, practically on the ground in working in the context of offering religious consultations for individuals that struggle with psychological uh, or mental health uh, um, issues. So I'll let, um, I don't know how they've decided to navigate their discussion, I'll let them sort of take over, inshallah, from here. <laughs>